in the first panel, uh, the focus was on uh, West European perspective on Polish-Russian uh, dialogue. In the second one, uh, we are going to um, uh, talk about uh, regional perspective. Uh, we have very distinctive panelists um, uh, here behind this table. Um, I have a pleasure to welcome and introduce to you Michael Kozan from Prague, Deputy Director of the Institute for International Relations, Czech Republic. We are, yes, I say him. Uh, we'll uh, have a chance to hear Andreas Prutz, Director of Latvian Institute for International Affairs, Latvia. And we'll have uh, enormous pleasure to hear Charles Gatti uh, from uh, Washington, D.C., but uh, with uh, um, a Hungarian origin, let's say, and the author of, of the very important books, um, uh, Washington, Budapest, and 1956, about uh, Hungarian revolt, Hungarian uprising, the bloc that failed, and um, Hungary and the Soviet bloc. Uh, last but not least, I would like to inform you that uh, in autumn of this uh, year, new book will going to appear called Zbig, uh, the Stagecraft and Strategy of Zbigniew Brzeziński, uh, first book in English on Zbigniew Brzeziński, and uh, Charles um, is an ed editor and co-author of this book. So um, all of you are strongly recommended to follow the adv adv advertisement uh, and, um, and go to the shops um, for uh, the copy. You see, uh, I did a little better than, than uh, Kurt Walker. I asked him <laughs> to do the advertisement <laughs> for me. <laughs> yes, you know, um, Charles um, served in the State Department, as you, uh, most of you probably uh, know, in the 90s, and was one of the uh, most determined uh, and most effective uh, advocate for NATO enlargement. Um, so he, um, in some extent, uh, was in the position to fight with the argument that uh, uh, NATO enlargement would provide the harm for uh, and including Poland and other countries of the region, would provide the harm to uh, West-Russia relations. So um, uh, I expect um, to hear from him um, what are the, uh, his own assessment of what has happened uh, after the enlargement of NATO and how these relations between countries of the region and Russia um, uh, have been developing since. And there is also very particular reasons I invited uh, these three gentlemen to speak in the panel. And they are not only my friends, which is what is obvious, of course, uh, but um, uh, they represent um, um, three neighboring, let's say, uh, uh, nations to Poland, uh, which uh, same share uh, some Polish experience uh, of the relation, relationship with Russia. Um, they have or may have um, their own reasons to reconcile with, uh, with Russia. Baltic states, uh, Latvia, were invaded and then incorporated to the Soviet Empire in 1939-1940. Hungary experienced Soviet intervention in 1956, uh, when Hungarian aspirations for freedom were cracked down by brutal Soviet force. And the Czechs experienced the same in 1968. Uh, I have an impression that all these three nations uh, have very different approach uh, towards the, you know, shaping uh, the relations with, uh, with Russia today. They have very different um, um, experience with uh, reconciliation. Uh, with um, former uh, empire. Uh, so, and uh, the widespread in Russia wisdom says that they are, are far less Russophobic than the Poles are. So, um, that's our, our main reasons why I decided to have these three gentlemen behind this table. And I would like to hear from them 
first uh, um, about their own assessment of Polish-Russian uh, dialogue. Uh, second, uh, how they uh, countries uh, shape the relations with uh, with Russia today. How what's their uh, um, approach towards, let's say, dialogue and understanding with Russia, and uh, what are um, let's say the impact of Polish-Russian relations for their own respective foreign policies. So now uh, three main question to the questions to the uh, to the panelists, and uh, I would like to give the floor to Michael Kozan from Prague. Michael, the floor is yours. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Slavik. It's uh, it's a great honor to be here at the CSIS for me and and and, and this distinguished company. And I'll try to do my best uh, with the opportunity to share with you some Czech reflections on on the issue that we are discussing here today. Um, even though I know that Czech Republic is not extremely interesting at this point, but I believe that the, the, the case kind of might bear some uh, broader, uh, uh, broader uh, consequences. At the beginning, I would like to draw or, or to, to share with you the, the view of how an analyst from the Czech Republic sees the current development with Russia. And first, uh, what I think is, uh, uh, f from my point of view, needs to be said, and, and then I will get to the uh, Russian-Polish dialogue, uh, is that there is a big fragmentation and incompatibility when it comes to articula uh, articulation of a policy towards Russia. And this, and this um, fragmentation can be found on the transatlantic level, on the European level, of course, but very importantly, on the central European level, and extremely importantly, there is a great um, incompatibility within the Czech Republic itself. And uh, therefore, the Czech Republic um, um, uh, lacks some vision of what to do, uh, what to do, what to do with Russia. But I will get, I will get to this. What is, uh, what is the uh, se second, uh, uh, second larger th uh, theme? Is that? Uh, Russia is perceived by the Czechs um, uh, as more and more a, a coherent and assertive and unpredictable partner to deal with. Uh, third, there is a growing, argu or, uh, growing uh, understanding in, in the Czech Republic and in the region, I believe, that the, uh, that the um, growing U.S. willingness to strike bilateral deals with Russia increases the Russian maneuver space uh, in certain segments of Central Europe. And uh, fourth, it is clear, or th that's the perception, that the relative U.S. withdrawal from Europe is closely watched by Russia with the argument that now when the United States are pulling off, we need to increase the security and political interdependence within, uh, uh, within Europe, between Russia and Europe. And, if, and I'm sure that you, you've seen the latest, um, uh, the latest concept of Russian foreign policy, which was signed by the uh, Russian president in February uh, 2013, this point is clearly there, that, that Russia uh, is uh, poised to move closer to the West, but to Europe and not to the United States. So this, this kind of a scenario is very worrying for, for, uh, for Central Europe. Um, therefore, to... Um, and how to how how the Czech Republic uh, perceives the the, the Polish Russian dialogue? I was trying to do some some interviews uh, with the politicians, with the with the uh, with the um, diplomats, because at first I was not exactly sure if if it's really followed that closely, and I was surprised that it is. And uh, there are several reasons for that. Uh, first of all, the Czech Republic does not have the capacities, does not have the skills, the experiences, or or neither. <laughs> Uh, necessary incentives to establish such a dialogue with uh, with Russia. Uh, second, the the overall nature of the Czech uh, uh, foreign policy towards Russia tends to be very reactive, not proactive, and therefore it would be welcomed uh, to see some proactive and permanent relations uh, being developed uh, developed in the region. Third, Poland is considered. Uh, to be one of the two to be one of the two only strategic partners of the Czech Republic in Europe, the other one being Germany, and the level between the Czechs and Poles is unprecedented and unsurpassed in in Europe, in the history. 
Um, so if there is a dialogue being uh, developed, then I believe that the Czech Republic would, uh, would very much trust that, that uh, this might work. Even though I'm not saying that, that the interests are, uh, the, the, are the same, neither I'm suggesting that Poland should be uh, responsible for the Czech foreign policy towards Russia. But what I'm saying is that, that this forum might, might have uh, some uh, broader uh, implications. Uh, which brings me to the, to the Central European uh, uh, level or dimension. Um, especially the Visegrad group, which is a group consisting of the Czech Republic, Hungary, Slovakia, and Poland. And uh, uh, even though that the Visegrad group is very coherent lately, is very cooperative, is uh, very effective, there is zero interactions with Russia. And, uh, and it, it seems to me that Russia likes it this way, and, and it's not going to change uh, in, in, in the foreseeable future. So it's important that the, the biggest of us is having this, this kind of a dialogue. Um, now let me move closer to the Czech Republic itself, which is maybe the case study of what is going on in Central Europe when it comes to Russia. Uh, things would be much easier if the Czech Republic uh, was able to formulate and execute its own sound and coherent policy towards Russia. Uh, and I would like to say that there are even some comparative advantages uh, that might put the Czech diplomacy in a better position than, uh, than diplomacy of other countries. For example, the, the burdens of historical uh, grievances and distrust is very much non-existent when compared to the case of Poland or Hungary or the Baltic countries. Of course, there was the invasion of Czechoslovakia, but then uh, the Czech communists were very much involved. And besides, it was the Poles, Polish and, and Hungarian armies that were trying to liberate um, uh, us too. So. Uh, and uh, uh, aside, aside this, there is not much of, of a reason of, of being, um, uh, of, of being uh, distrustful to, to, to Russia based on history. Furthermore, the Czech Republic does not border neither with Russia nor with the Eastern Partnership countries, which again makes uh, much more room for, uh, for us to maneuver in many areas more freely. Um, also, we're less dependent on energy imports uh, from Russia than, than the other countries in the region. In the region. Yet, for some reason, the Czech policy towards Russia is very odd. First, in comparison with Poland, again, there is very low political, academic, public, and societal interest in Eastern Europe and in Russia in general. Uh, um, second, and I'm, I'm not afraid to say that the 1990s were a, were a completely was a completely lost decade uh, from the Czech foreign policy point of view. We were completely obsessed with ignoring Russia and, and Eastern Europe. And uh, we, co we, we very willingly bought into the Russian uh, discourse of the relationship, which was basically about the disagreement, uh, uh, Russian disagreement uh, over the NATO enlargement. Um, third, and most importantly, and I will dwell a little bit upon this issue, is that the Czech Republic is uh, deeply divided between those who somehow shared the dissident past and who see uh, Russia very negatively, who perceive Russia as a security threat, who are very critical of the, of the uh, human rights and democracy tendencies um, um, uh, these days. And then there is a huge gap, which is pretty much not filled b by anyone except for, for, for career diplomats, probably. And there are those who do, who do not care about the internal development in Russia at all, who are very much willing, to, who are trying to pursue what was termed a pragmatic uh, cooperation, uh, regardless of what is going on in Russia. And this is the group that, which is represented best by the, uh, the ex-president Václav Klaus, by the current president uh, Miloš Zeman, while the first group is kind of a, is a kind of a heritage of the late president Václav Havel. Um, this means that the Czech policy, that there is no policy at all. Uh, because on the one hand, um, I, I know it's funny, but it's true. Uh, because on the one hand, there is a, there in, the new Czech, in the Czech conception of foreign policy, there is this saying that we want to pursue pragmatic economic relations, uh, which is good. And uh, always when a president or prime minister travels to Russia, he brings a large suite of entrepreneurs. He even, uh, secure, uh, the, they even secure some important deals, for example, modernization of the helicopters, uh, uh, some infrastructure constructions. But then again, there is uh, uh, another very influential group who, who is afraid of the Russian economic influence in the Czech Republic, who is pointing at the fact that 
Uh, there are 1,700 companies. There is a lot of investments, banks, steel uh, mills, and etc. But these, the economic influence is rapidly um, uh, has a rapid ramification into the politics and into the policies. So there is no way of, of uh, having a pragmatic economic re relationship if there is this kind of a fear. Uh, second, if um, uh, if, if the, the top executive face-to-face -face meeting are always extremely rosy. Our president, uh, he, he never, he would never, I mean, I'm talking about Václav Klaus, he would never bring up a, a, a controversial issue. Uh, when um, uh, President Medvedev when was in Prague in December 2011, just after the, the elections, our president said, well, it's your election and we have no business to talk about it. It's your business and we're not gonna talk about it. At the same time, there is very critical media, our uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Karol Schwarzenberg, he never shied away from, uh, from criticizing uh, th th this, uh, this policy. And the latest example is our Prime Minister uh, who was in, in, in um, Moscow about, um, what is it, a, a week or two weeks ago. And he was, criticizing, he was criticizing the Pussy Riot affair, but from the uh, Moscow point of view. And, uh, so we, we, and, and at the same time, uh, we have very critical, uh, very critical uh, discourse, uh, which is, for example, translated into the dealing of the Czech Republic with the NATO, still sticking to the NATO enlargement agenda, very, very assertive uh, uh, in the Russian-NATO dialogue. So what I'm trying to say is there, there is no way of, of executing uh, a sound and coherent policy. This is bad for the Czech Republic from its own uh, uh, interests, but it is also bad for, for the reason that Europe and Central Europe really needs to formulate some, some coherent policy uh, towards, uh, towards Russia, and the Czech Republic is nowhere in the position to contribute to that debate. And uh, uh, Slavik also asked me to say a few words about what to do about what, what, what we are finding um, what, what, what about these findings? Well, I don't know what to do. We, we have to we have to play with the cards we have, right? Um, uh, if if there is a fear that, that the politicians are kind of owned by the Russian mafia, and on the, on the other hand, there are those who who think that all the evil comes from Moscow. There is not much to do about it. But but um, uh, what I wanted to reflect, and that's that's how I would like to conclude. And I was glad to hear that this discussion kind of took off in the first panel is that uh, the Czech Republic is a good example of, of making a mistake of, sorry, of distinguishing between values and interests. Uh, from my point of view, it's, um, it's wrong that, um, first of all, value stems from interest or interest stems, uh, stem fr from value. How can you distinguish between, between the two of them? Uh, it is always easier to deal on the most important security, economic, uh, environmental, global trade, whatever issue, you name it. It's always easier to deal with a country that, that shares your values. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's impossible to say that, that we have to give in some values in order to, to deal on, a, on hard security matters because if the values and the interests uh, are kind of respectful to each other, then there is no distinction. And from my point of view, uh, if we say that we put interest in, in front of values, then we're basically buying values of someone else. And, and uh, but the, 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 this distinction doesn't work. And the, the, the clear example for me is, and I was not talking about Russia in particular in this case, I was talking about our self-confidence, is um, that if we somehow accept the story, and it was told here too in the first panel, that we accept the story of, of, um, uh, of the democratic uh, movement is over, a story of the world of zero-sum games, of the, of the world of um, not multilateral but multipolar. If we accept this notion, um, then I would like you once again to look at the Russian foreign policy concept because this is precisely the world that Russian uh, wants us to steer. Uh, I mean the current government, I'm not seeing Russians, I'm, I'm, I apologize for that. And um, uh, it seems to me that, that foreign policy is um, and I'm coming back to the Czech case, uh, that foreign policy is not only about e e expression of interests and values, but it's also expression of, of self-confidence or of lack of self-confidence and of fears. And if we accept this notion on the, on the part of the Czech Republic, then I think we are expressing our fears and, uh, and lack of self-confidence. Thank you.
Thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Michael. Uh, the, the conclusion is that uh, the Czech Republic um, does not have its own coherent uh, uh, policy towards Russia due to the fact that there are um, um, various different uh, conflicting with each other uh, approaches uh, uh, in the same time are important and uh, taking into account uh, within internal Czech debate about the foreign policy, of, uh, generally speaking. Uh, we will come back uh, to uh, this point um, uh, during the discussion. Uh, now I would like to give the floor to Andris, and um, uh, I would like to hear, um, let's say, the, the, the point of view of a uh, Latvian speaker, but uh, I expect uh, from you also some, some words concerning more general Baltic approach towards this uh, particular uh, problem we talk about today. Uh, uh, thank you, Slavomir. Uh, first, I guess uh, I must say uh, thank you to Slavomir Heather for having having me here. Uh, I am back to Washington almost every second month, and I am really I'm really happy to to, to be back here. And you also, collect frequent. Well, uh, yes, <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So, I think I've learned some business flight. Um, it's pleasure, and I will start what Michal said, that the Czech Republic, if I understood you correctly, it's not interesting in a sense. I think Latvia is very interesting, <laughs> I must immediately say. Uh, it's a country which uh, is joining, the only country which is joining the, what some would call Titanic, Eurozone, next year. We've just been invited to start negotiations with OECD, uh, together with Colombia, not Lithuanians, Estonians already are in, and just Two days ago, there were municipal elections, an allegedly pro-Russian party in a capital city received 60%. And we have a second term for a Russian, uh, Russian mayor in Riga, capital city. Actually, even in imperial times, of, uh, or in Soviet times, we didn't have a mayor which was ethnically Russian. So I think there are interesting developments in, on, many, on many fronts. If you ask me about the Baltics, I always, and I will start just, just a small disclaimer, I'm always tempted to say this disclaimer because, of course, we are Baltic country, we are representing Baltics, but not to forget the Baltics are as well quite diverse. And uh, I'm not going into the details again, so let's, let's say Lithuanians are Central Europeans, the Estonians are Nor Northern Europeans. And Latvians, of course, remain as the only Baltic country, actually. <laughs> so, uh, and, uh, and, and coming back to what Janusz said, and already is one of the only things, of course, which has been, and not the only, but I'm a little bit exaggerating, but one of still the only things which has been uniting factor for the Baltic unity, Baltic perception, Baltic school, whatever Riga school, some would call it. It's, of course, Russia. But even with Russia, and I come what, what Janusz was said about pragmatism, just a small example, for Latvians, pragmatism in the last years has meant um, to make, to improve political relations so that it serves as a good basis for intensifying business relations. In Estonian case, the, actually it's opposite. The pragmatism means not to engage in improving political relations because business pragmatically must solve their own business challenges. Yeah. So you see that also how the pragmatism is being defined in the Baltic countries actually with regard to Russia is different. Yeah, so that's why this is starting point that there are similarities, but at the same time, of course, there are differences. To the panel about the Polish-Russian I don't want to use the word reconciliation, reset, re-engagement, uh, uh, rapprochement, whatever you call it, but I think reconciliation is a more fundamental word. But dialogue. Or dialogue. dialogue, or dialogue, absolutely, or dialogue. Uh, I think this panel, what I noticed in a, in a timetable in a program, is the longest one. Uh, so it means probably the most heaviest one, it's a central one. And actually, it's probably even not by, by incident, by another accident, in a sense. Why? Because if I would, if I would ask, and the, one of the ideas is what kind of impact it has on the region. So I think that Polish-Russian dialogue, the strongest impact has exactly an East Central Europe, whatever I call it, Central and East Europe. Now there is some, some new term, East Central Europe. And of course, also in the Baltic countries. 
Yeah. So uh, I think it has been an important transformative game changer. I would not say that it's a geopolitical or geoperceptual uh, revolution, but I think in terms of geopolitics and regional dynamics, in terms of changing perceptions, has been a very important element in, in, in the region. I would even refer to quite an old uh, concept of overlay by Barry Buzan some 30 years ago. And he said that, of course, Europe was overlaid uh, by the great powers during the Cold War, that basically the all security dynamic within the region was frozen by the, by the domination of those two superpowers. Of course, the, way, the first unfreezer was exactly the end of the Cold War, when dynamics started. I would say the second unfreezer, on second game changer, was becoming the EU and NATO members. Some would even say with EU and NATO membership, we started to have normal foreign policy. Because back in the 1990s, it was adjusting fulfilling criteria of joining EU and NATO. So I would say exactly 2004, we start to behave as a normal foreign policy or, or defining the normal, in a sense, the, the, the uh, national interests. I would say the third one uh, is exactly the Polish-Russian dialogue. Because the Poland played, in a sense, stabilizing role in the region with regard to Russia. Yeah. So because it was always cautious, whatever, cold warrior, as some would define, or cautious, uh, cautious, uh, cautious, uh, co cold or distant pragmatism. But anyway, so this was always in a sort of cautious relationship with regard to Russia. And it has, uh, in a sense, uh, changed this cautiousness, there's been proactiveness, and this, of course, has also to, uh, had a contributing effect on the whole region. Not only this one, of course, American and Russian reset as well, also economic, economic recession. Economic recession, all those three factors have sort of made the last or third wave of rechanging, reshaping, and freezing the overlay. The countries start to, start to behave very much in a way how they perceive as important for national interest, for sort of their own national, national vision. And you can see in the Baltics already, if we still th speak about the region, you can see in the Baltics, there is increasing competition in the last decade among the Baltic countries, especially in the econom economic domain. There is, in a sense, economization of foreign policies as well. Uh, there is a, uh, a volatility of Polish-Lithuanian relations. I think we haven't mentioned this, and I think this is a very important factor of somehow the paradox with, in a sense, the scissors. While Polish-Russian relations are going up, the Polish-Lithuanian relations are going down. And uh, is there a correlation? We may ask those questions, of course, but I think we can observe that there is some dynamics within the region which was not uh, observable before. Also, reconciliating uh, or uh, reconciliation of relations with Russia. And as I already mentioned, there are a couple of pragmatisms, a couple of, couple of resets in the region as well. One of the resets was uh, or is between Latvia and Russia. I would say more was than is, yeah, because I think the recent year, that the, there has been quite a challenging and complicated year for the Latvian and Russian relations. What is recent about Latvia and Russia? Uh, a couple of just uh, the, the symptoms or indications of this. Valdis Zatler, our president, 2010, the visit to Moscow. There was no the state visit before to Moscow by Latvian president. Back in 1994, okay, it was signing the border agreement, but basically it was not a full state official visit by the state president. So 2010, the first time actually in Latvian Russian history. The border agreement also signed in 2007, so that's why we can not also say that uh, the Polish, uh, the Polish-Russian dialogue has somehow always preceded the Russian-Latvian interaction, because actually the border agreement already is a, the idea to sign the border agreement started immediately after joining EU and NATO, and actually it was signed and ratified in 2007. The, now well, you can also see in economic domain quite a positive relations. We have increasing numbers of uh, trade volumes. Now, Russia has become from somewhere around fifth, seventh trading partner, last year the second trading partner. And additionally to this uh, Northern Distribution Network, which is in a sense win-win game for the region, the pan-European pan, pan or pan-continental uh, cooperative effort, I think also is is example of this int int intensifying relations. Even as an example, I can also say that a couple of years ago, the Latvian and Russian embassy organized the event here in Washington, D.C. So it was unimaginable some years ago. Yeah? So there was combined effort as well in this regard. 
At the same time, the historical football, of course, continues, and this has very much came, come, come out in the last years, especially the last year. The minority issue is on the table, and in 2012, we had a referendum on a state language, Russian as a second state language. Of course, it again, you can say, radicalized society and, and sort of perceptions, and it, it brought out uh, you can see the ghosts of the past and ghosts of the of the of the of the uh, some concerns as well and distancing. Uh, also, the perceived risks of strategic and economic presence. That of course the Russian business comes with some routines, business practices which might influence as well political culture and political practices. Yeah, so, and I think these perceived risks are no, not always unjustified as well. So uh, as uh, Sikorsky and I just a uh, couple of days ago, I reread his article on the, 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 the foreign affairs on a, on a, on a Polish, Polish foreign policy, and he said the 20th century has been a roller coaster for the Poland. I would say that it's still a roller coaster for uh, Latvian-Russian relations in the last year. So we have ups and downs as well, and we had some ups a couple of years ago, but I think now we have some downs as well. At the same time, all of this changing transformative regional environment has made some, uh, some differences and some changes. First of all, no regional consensus. There's diversity of concepts how to deal with Russia. Uh, there is no domestic consensus, and I think to some extent already Michal said it, that how to deal with Russia if there was domestic consensus basically back in the 1990s, so it's much less now. And once more, coming uh, back to municipal elections, actually many Latvians voted for the so-called pro-Russian party. It was not imaginable, you can say, some 10 years ago. Yeah? So now it seems it's not anymore that important factor, just the ethnicity and, the, let's say, Russian factor as a such. And also what, uh, what uh, James was mentioning, I think there is also this certainly realization, strategic instrumentality, I would call it, that relations with Russia for the Baltics and also for Latvia, it's not just about relations with Russia, it's about relations with our Western partners. If you want to be like-minded, if you sort of want to establish security community, if you want to be perceived, or we perceive that if you want to be perceived as the like-minded and equal and mature, and not any more victimized, we need to engage Russia in a strategic way as well. Yeah? So there is certainly a strategic instrumental, I mean, instrumentality behind it as well. Um, and I'm coming uh, gradually to the end. Um, of course, there are, even though there are some resemblances of these resets in engaging Russia, of course, there are also differences. And differences very shortly uh, between Russia and the Baltic countries, and also Latvia, of course, it's asymmetries of size, so it's very asymmetrical one. It's not really the equal, of course, it's unequal, and it's very difficult, I think, for Russia especially, to have equal partnership among absolutely unequal uh, by size uh, partners. There is what's difference from the Polish-Russian dialogue. We have a big number of minorities, this is absolutely the, 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 the different aspect. And we have also historical factor. I think our historical factor, it's much more difficult to change. And there's minorities, historical football, uh, asymmetry size come together. And again, one month ago, next to the Victory Monument, which is monument for liberating Soviet Latvia in 1945, there were 200,000 people of Russian origin in Latvia. Of course, this means that there is still a lot of tension, and this is not just about interstate relations. Basically, it's about two intrastate relations between Russia with interstate relations and Latvia with interstate relations. And uh, as a symptom of this, and I, 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 I sort of, you asked me about the as well institutional one. I think there is no, uh, no, no commission for difficult matters, even though some ideas have been sort of the, the promoted that we should also establish something similar as Poland has established. Actually, resistance has been from both sides, including from Latvian side as well, because then a minority issue can be, for instance, put on the table on agenda. Yeah? So that's why both sides are not, there are limits to engaging into the, into the dialogue. We have inter intergovernmental commission, we call commission of historians. It has some minor achievements, access to archives, but at, at the very end, so the, I don't think so that we can have some breakthroughs. Uh, to conclude, a uh, couple of things. There is impact of Polish-Russian dialogue, one thing. The Poland has become indispensable, to paraphrase Madeleine Oler, regional, uh, regional uh, trendsetter and, 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 and player in the region. There are 
positive things, but there are also risks of intra-regional tensions. Polish-Lithuanian example is unfortunately the, one of the negative examples. Uh, there is also the positive things that I think uh, it is also an example of a reflection of increased self-confidence that we feel after the EU and NATO membership more Im immune and more self-confidence that we can engage and we even need to engage. Uh, last but not least, of course, very much will depend also what will happen within European Union and NATO and uh, what will happen also in Russia because at the very end it's two to tango as well. I think I will finish with this, ah, and then one, probably the last, very shortly, what to do. I think this theme, theme was uh, recurrent in my presentation already on, on a couple of occasions. I think that Poland is very good that you brought us, Baltics and other people, sort of in a wider dialogue, because I think what Kurt was saying, that there are some concerns that actually Polish-Russian relations might take place at the expense of somebody else who is in between. That's why I think it's very important to have this wider, 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 uh, the wider framework of engagement. And the second thing is probably you need to establish also difficult matters commission for Poland and Lithuania. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrzej. So um, we have just heard uh, an excellent uh, analytical, analytically well-balanced uh, intervention concerning uh, Latvian approach to our relations with Russia and how um, uh, Latvia sees uh, Polish-Russian uh, dialogue. Uh, and now uh, we are going to move south and uh, the floor goes to Charles Gatti. Charles. Thank you very much. It's very nice to look out here from here and see uh, so many old friends, uh, some with uh, white hair like mine, some uh, uh, not, uh, including those at that time. I was just looking at that table and there is Ross Johnson who played such an important role in U.S. policy towards uh, Eastern Europe. There is Steve Larrabee who uh, you mentioned uh, NATO enlargement. There are a few people in this city who played a more important role. There is Bob Norick, and I'm not going to go on from there. Thank you, Heather, for the invitation. And it is wonderful to see, uh, uh, see uh, uh, former Foreign Minister Rothfeld, a very old friend we will not mention here when we met the first time, but it was not yesterday, uh, 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 for sure. Uh, although I will borrow one of the things that you did say at the Polish embassy yesterday, but uh, let me come to that. Uh, the reference to, uh, and the implication here is that I could somehow uh, speak on behalf of uh, Hungary's uh, 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 policies. That is very, very difficult for at least two critically important reasons. One is that I am in complete opposition to the current Hungarian government's foreign and domestic policies. So, so therefore, please keep that in mind. I'm a critic. Uh, they say I'm an enemy. Uh, actually, last week, George Soros preceded me as the enemy number one with two other Hungarian-Hungarians uh, uh, on, on, in some article. But for several uh, years now, uh, I had the, uh, the honor of uh, being listed, together with Secretary of State uh, Hillary Clinton, by the way, which made, uh, whom I had never met in my life, but together we were preparing a conspiracy, supposedly, for the overthrow of the Hungarian government. So please keep in mind that there is no way that I can be heard of or pretend to speak on behalf of uh, this current Hungarian government. But there is another reason for that, a more complex one, which is that, uh, that uh, yeah, I, I've been in this country now for more than 56 years. And so for those who might not know, I have had two American-born wives, not, not at the same time, but I want to, <laughs> just to be sure, uh, five, five, five American-born uh, children uh, and uh, uh, 10 American-born grandchildren and one American-born great Grandchild, I, I'm pretty sure the number. Congratulations! Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, now, I still believe that Hungarian food is the best food there is. Uh, I do believe that uh, the Hungarian musicians, mathematicians, physicists, uh, among others, uh, are particularly gifted and talented, and made a made a deep uh, uh, 
contribution. But other than that, I think I will have to claim uh, that I speak here more as an American than as a Hungarian, um, all the more so because you mentioned that I even worked at the uh, State Department. Okay. Uh, my initial plan was to, to, uh, to uh, uh, divide my talk into two parts. One is to uh, make some comments on Polish-Russian relations and then uh, uh, talk about the possible impact of that or consequences or ramifications of that dialogue, relationship, whatever we call it, on uh, the rest of Central Europe. But uh, last night, you told me to ma uh, add a third part, which I was only too delighted to do, which is to add my own conclusions to this. And I can hardly wait to get to that point, actually. <laughs> uh, uh, and it will take a few minutes. OK, so the first part has to do with uh, Poland's opening to Russia. I do consider that, as I s had occasion to write about this and to say it certainly publicly, that, that I'm a great fan of this Polish government's opening to Russia and opening to, to Germany and generally Polish foreign policy. I think the opening to Russia, uh, 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 which of course precedes, as, as uh, uh, Mr. Rothfeld correctly pointed out, precedes this government, and he made a contribution to that, and Geremek made a contribution to that, and Skubyshevsky made a contribution to that. So this, this has been going on for quite some time, and yet the fruits of this probably, uh, you know, it came to fruition to some extent um, only in recent, uh, recent years, but thanks are due to many others. I think this is a breakthrough. I think uh, uh, the, what we have to talk about is the political uh, how politically brave, as well as wise, this, poli this Polish government uh, has been. Brave because domestically the basis was weak uh, for this kind of approach. After all, Poland has had, but the Polish people have had good reasons for many centuries to be so, so very suspicious of, uh, of Russians. Uh, and to overcome that is not exactly easy, given the current uh, po Polish domestic political situation where you do have uh, uh, a right-wing party uh, full of old suspicions and unwilling to understand that, that the 21st century has arrived. Uh, the key word here for those who know Polish, I don't, but the, uh, this word I happen to know, is, is ukwad, the constant thinking of conspiracies, uh, uh, particularly coming from the Russians, but, uh, but coming also from Germans, from, from Jews, from, uh, you know, uh, Lithuanians for that matter, uh, and, and many others, and that Poland is, is on its own, it cannot integrate itself into the world because the enemies uh, are all over. Well, to overcome this and to say, uh, time has come to reconsider to be careful, we have reason to be careful, but still we have to approach both Russia and Germany in a different sort, sort of way. To overcome the Kaczynski phenomenon in this respect domestically is no small achievement. Uh, and I think, I think our friends uh, who have participated in this, uh, obviously Prime Minister Tusk and Foreign Minister Sikorsky in particular, they deserve a lot of admiration for what they have done. I will say some critical things too in just a moment, but, uh, but I wanted to start with the political uh, 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 courage here that they have had. But this has also been very wise policy for Poland. Um, the recognition that military conflict, particularly one originating in Russia, is most unlikely. I mean, after all, keep in mind that even under communist rules, when Poland big asserted some kind of independence, semi-independence, or the people uh, uh, expressed some, some views contrary to communist dogma or, or Soviet uh, uh, policies, the Russians, the Soviets, excuse me, never interfered militarily, never intervened militarily. They would have had a reason. You will know the date, just, I just have to give you the dates. Think of 1956. Think of, of, uh, of 1970. Think of 19, maybe even 1968, who knows. 1970, 1976, 1981. 80, 81, and not once did a Soviet tank uh, come in. They almost did, almost, but they didn't. 
They in were already present. Huh? They were already present. Well, they were already present. So they got their way by other means. They did not, they, well, of course they did politically. But it's one thing to get your way politically. Uh, another thing is to intervene militarily. So the question, I think, even though it's not likely that Polish politicians are going to say this pu publicly or often, uh, the fact of the matter is if they did not intervene then, would this today's Russia intervene militarily in Central Europe? It, to me, I mean, they couldn't get their way disgusting as their policy towards Georgia was. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't even manage to do very well there. This is not the same, uh, this is not the Soviet Union. I think uh, 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 Professor Rothfeld made a comment about the domestic preoccupation of Russia. They had lost the outer empire in Eastern Europe. They had lost the inner empire in the Soviet Union. And their primary concern today uh, is the loss of the Russian empire, whether it is central, uh, in Central Asia or whether it is, not, I'll take that back, not Central Asia, but Siberia, of course, and the Muslim areas. I mean, this is a country now uh, on the verge of, of the third biggest challenge. And the question is, can they overcome? Are they interested in invading Poland? So uh, that was an editorial, an analytic editorial here. But it's against that background, in part, that Poland has been able to develop um, uh, better relations with Russia. But it could do so only because of NATO enlargement. Uh, it could do so only because uh, NATO is providing uh, uh, protection. Um, and because Polish diplomacy, even going back to Olechowski, another foreign minister I didn't mention before, I remember when he came to the State Department in 93 demanding, demanding uh, NATO enlargement. At that point, we were at Partnership for Peace. If anybody still remembers that, I know Steve would, uh, but others as well. And I remember when he, uh, he came in, uh, I can't imagine that it's a secret, he came in to see the Secretary of State and he sat on, he, he went like this, and of course the Secretary of State had never seen anybody do this, and said, I demand an answer to the, about the question. Is there going to be NATO enlargement or not? Or are we going to be stuck at this partnership for peace that nobody fully understood what it exactly uh, was? Uh, so it really goes back to NATO enlargement, uh, Poland being a very good member of, of NATO, but it also, uh, a Russian opening could not have happened without EU backing and, and, uh, and protection. Um, Poland, officially at least, has overcome Euroscepticism that the other countries in the region, including uh, the Czech Republic, but especially Hungary, could not uh, do. And of course, embracing Germany the way uh, Tusk and, and, and Sikorsky have done is, is a historical breakthrough of considerable significance, and it is indeed, uh, 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 should be mentioned together with German-French rapprochement. So my conclusion here is that the Russian opening could not have happened without NATO, without the European Union, and without defeating the political mentality, or at least for the time being, defeating the political mentality of Ukwad, this uh, conspiracy-inspired nonsense that has, has, has been, a, 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 unfortunately, a part of not only Polish history, but of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the neighbor's policies uh, as well. Now, has it had any impact on the other countries is the second question. And I think not very much, actually. Uh, the Polish example has not been uh, particularly influential, unfortunately, in my view, unfortunately. Uh, we just heard that the, the Czechs uh, are divided. Uh, you know, you have had Eurosceptics like Klaus. There is uh, Zeman, who is a dubious uh, uh, character. Uh, to put it mildly, excuse me for saying that, but uh, 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 I do remember articles when he was prime minister, articles about how his uh, chancellor was, was infected with Russian uh, quote-unquote businessmen uh, and, and others. Uh, uh, and
And um, uh, Latvia, we understand that we're with a huge Russian min minority, and perhaps for other reasons, business certainly, a lot of corruption. Lithuania, more and more corruption. Uh, it's, uh, I, I, can't, I can't see another country uh, in the region that is following the Polish example of being very open to Europe, and with that backing, gradually opening up to Russia as well. The worst uh, country in this respect, I'm sorry to say, is Hungary, um, that is moving away from Europe and towards the East. Uh, it, it is even claiming to have discovered that historically it belongs to the East or it comes from the East, despite the fact that the country's well, spiritual founder uh, uh, what, 1,100 years ago, St. Stephen, uh, embraced uh, Western Christianity. Uh, but now this is, uh, uh, well, not totally forgotten, but it is being played down. And so uh, Hungarian foreign policy, not in words, but in deeds, is now a kind of bridge or perceived to be a bridge between East and West and, and uh, relations with, uh, with the worst uh, dictatorships in Central, uh, Central Asia have uh, uh, greatly uh, improved, uh, if, that's, uh, if that's the right uh, uh, word for that. Worse than that, in the last three years, the country's political culture has been reoriented towards the East and away from the West. Uh, the Prime Minister speaks about the decline of West, the decline of Europe, and of course it's easy to criticize Brussels. We all find you know, fault there. Uh, but this is a major effort that's uh, been going on since uh, the end of World War II, and to, to dismiss it so, so lightly. But in the very same speech where he speaks about the decline of Europe and of the West, in the very same speech he would say that in 20 years though we will catch up uh, with the European Union's average living standards and be happy ever after. So um, uh, th this, there's a kind of also domesticism there, uh, uh, you know, looking inward that is also in other countries, not much interest in foreign affairs as there is in Poland. Uh, the foreign policy institutes never do anything uh, elsewhere that is even slightly independent from the foreign ministry which finances it, uh, finances uh, the, uh, these institutes. So. Um, I would say that in the, just one, one last sentence about Hungary is that aside from military cooperation within NATO, which continues and which is not, uh, not, not uh, uh, deeply harmed, uh, I would have to say that Hungary is no longer a reliable Western ally and certainly Poland is. And so are some of the others who are less interested in uh, maintaining uh, the pro-Western orientation, like Estonia, for example, is another example, Slovenia, perhaps. My own conclusions then, uh, uh, briefly, I, um, I, uh, um, <clears throat> I would say that, um, that I, I very much agree with Professor Rothfeld's comment last night at the Polish Embassy, where he, towards the end of his talk, he called attention to uh, to what we need to look for, what, what, what is at least a research, but certainly a political agenda, which is that the issues are not only, and perhaps not even mainly, um, relations with, uh, uh, between and among nations in Europe, but within, uh, uh, within the, the countries of Europe and of uh, the former uh, Soviet Union. Uh, I don't, uh, he, he did not have the time to develop this, perhaps here uh, uh, he will. Um, but I think, now, uh, not, not citing him but myself, but I think there is a huge problem with Russia above all. And that is the, 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 uh, uh, the initial momentum that offered at least the possibility of democracy there in the 1990s. This has been reversed, not just arrested development, but this has been reversed. Uh, Russia today is certainly no democracy. It is a dictatorship light, 
perhaps, or maybe not even so so light. Uh, and 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 the but elsewhere in Europe, uh, this is spreading. Look at the news from Turkey. Extremely disturbing uh, news that uh, that's been happening. Uh, Hungary is an electoral democracy. There is a majority uh, that uh, that. Uh, I uh, was uh, formed in, a f in free elections, but majority rule has outwitted and suppressed minority rights. And so I don't call it anymore a, a democracy. Maybe it's an illiberal democracy. Maybe it is, a, 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 uh, it is some, something else. So I think for these reasons, it is extremely important that that we pay attention to not just the uh, uh, relations among countries in the region, but, but relations within. I realize this is difficult, intervention in internal affairs and all that kind of stuff, but the EU provides at least um, uh, uh, some, some possibility, and perhaps even NATO, to, uh, to, to intervene in internal affairs to try to shape them. Uh, the second uh, personal comment I would made is, make is that, um, you know, well, what should then Poland or the EU or the U.S. Uh, do under these cir circumstances? I have to say, and, and uh, some of our Polish friends might not exactly like what, what I'm about to say, I'm not surprised that uh, the U.S. or NATO are ineffective. Um, they may be concerned, but ineffective. They don't really know what to do. The instruments of policy are, are mi missing here. There is, you know, what, what do you do? You can't send the tanks in, okay? So uh, what economic sanctions, words, well, sure, there are words, but uh, they seem not to make much, uh, much difference on the key issue of what happens within, uh, within these countries. I am a little bit uh, surprised about Polish inactivity, well, with respect to Hungary in particular. Um, and, uh, you know, these are two countries with similar histories in many ways. Uh, the languages are very different, but this, but and friendship for hundreds and hundreds of years. There's considerable understanding of what's going on in Hungary, in Poland. But the official, whoever I talk to, uh, but the government uh, pretends that there is no problem or there is nothing uh, that can be done. I, I, I don't believe this to be the case. I understand the reasons for the silence, and that's Kaczynski. It's in one word. It's domestic Polish politics. And secondly, perhaps, because the EU's conservative bloc, the PP, they don't want to, to bring up the issue and lose uh, lose uh, uh, Hungary's uh, votes or the Fidesz party's votes. But keep in mind, Fidesz is not a conservative party. It is a radical, populist, nationalist, anti-European, anti-integrationist party. It has very little or nothing to do with conservatism, as I understand Tusk or Merkel or others to do. It has some similarities with the British conservatives. That is true, but that's another uh, issue. I don't understand Poland because uh, also because the virus, the Hungarian virus may spread and it may encourage um, a similar, you, you have the basis for this in not only in Kaczynski but in Radio Maria and, and further to the right. And I think some of our Polish friends are too comfortable assuming that the kind of sober, centrist, uh, good policies of the Tusk, Sikorsky type, that it will last forever. It may. I hope it will, but I'm not sure that it will. Um, well, I think I've talked too long, so I will just um, uh, uh, stop here by saying that I'm very much impressed by Polish-Russian relations. I am at least as impressed by Polish-German relations. I, uh, I'm sorry to report that, as much as I can tell, the impact of these very good steps and the strong support for the European Union, this uh, has not had sufficient resonance in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, including the Visegrad group. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charles. Uh, I'm sorry that I uh, rehungarized you for uh, the purpose of this panel. Um, now it, it, we have uh, 30 minutes uh, for uh, discussion. Uh, I would like to open uh, the floor 
for uh, interven interventions from the audience, from the questions. Uh, and uh, I will lose, I will, I'm going to use uh, this opportunity that I'm uh, a moderator of this panel to raise the following question to, um, to the panelists. Uh, there is a widespread um, view, both in Russia and, and outside as well, that the main driver uh, behind Russian interest in reconciliation with Poland well, uh, basically economic interest. Um, if we look at the uh, uh, map of Russian-European investitions, uh, we uh, immediately realize that there is a, um, that Poland uh, um, creates a very unique case. Russian investitions flows everywhere but Poland. Um, one day I uh, talked to one Russian uh, uh, official and he used uh, the example of Latvia uh, as uh, uh, the you know, uh, illustration of the thesis that uh, Poland may, may learn something from a uh, Latvian approach uh, uh, to Russian business. And he said that, uh, look, uh, Russians I may easily go to, to Riga, uh, buy the properties there. Um, they don't afraid much about uh, um, kind of Russophobia. Uh, uh, so uh, try to follow th this way. It could enhance interest inside Russian society in, de in deepening uh, uh, reconciliation with Poland. So my question is, how do you perceive this uh, poly Polish reluctance to Russian investitions? Is it a pragmatic approach, or it is a kind of uh, um, it is being driven by uh, uh, well uh, some our um, historic uh, ramifications? Uh, what's your uh, what's your take on that? Of course, the others are kindly. Uh, invited to write the questions, comments to the panelists. I'm not the only one. Okay. I see here. Uh, hi, Steve Zabo from the Transatlantic Academy here in Washington. I want, my friend Charles, I wanted to thank you all for a great panel. I wanted to go back to Charles's point about not worrying about Russian invasion, which is true in the old sense. But uh, if we look at the role of Gazprom and the issue of whether we're dealing with a mafia state, basically, in Russia. A lot of the panels brought this issue out about sort of the, the, the contrast between you know, economic interests and values. But I think Ann Applebaum had brought out the point that the Russian strategy today is quite different. It's basically to slowly corrupt and get acceptance of lower standards and to live with the kind of situation that we're looking at in Ukraine uh, and in Russia. So I'd like to get your comments a bit on all of you, and also whether you think the change in the energy environment is going to sort of undermine, perhaps, uh, this potential that Russia has had in the past. Okay. Uh, Adam Daniel Rothfeld. Yeah, yeah, well, the microphone is, is coming. First of all, I would like to say that I'm impressed by uh, all presentations in this uh, panel. and. Uh, it happened that a few days ago, that it was 22nd, 23rd of May, uh, I, I took part in the conference organized in Moscow by the uh, Minister of Defense uh, about the European security. The conference was a kind of the mixture of officials, ministers of, of defense, and uh, some uh, experts, intellectuals, but it was, I would say, uh, presentation was given at the beginning by high officials of Russia, a message from uh, President Putin by Sergei Ivanov, then Sergei Lavrov, then uh, Shoigu, uh, Minister of Defense. Altogether, it was a kind of the message given by the highest Russian officials towards uh, Europeans. And one element, what was very interesting, and I, I, 
I would like to say that I can repeat it because it was open a conference, not behind the closed doors, namely, uh, Sergei Lavrov, foreign minister, said that we are now confronted with the new partition of the sphere of interest in Europe. <laughs> and then in the discussion I said that it is a very common thinking uh, in Russia that everything already happened, that in fact that there is nothing new. Uh, uh, the sphere of interest, it was the policy of Metternich in, in, in Europe uh, uh, with the Holy Alliance, and then in different ways it was uh, after the First World War and continued in bipolar world uh, after the Second World War. But what happened now, it seems to me that it is a kind of the challenge to all the <laughs> governments, not only to Russia, that uh, the, the power is diffused. There are no centers of power. People, uh, many, many of uh, writers, political writers, spoke about uh, unipolarity, multipolarity. They, they have forgotten that polarity it is taken from physics and there are only two poles, plus and minus. <laughs> they cannot be many minuses and many <laughs> pluses. In other words, bipolarity is part of history. We entered into the world of uh, diffused centers of power. It is, a, I, I would say that it is a pluralistic world, very heterogeneous. And Russia is part of that world. This is my point, point one, that Russia should be, and uh, what uh, Charles Gatti said, uh, very positive about the present uh, Polish uh, leadership, Prime Minister Tusk and uh, Minister Sikorski, that in my view decisive was one sentence when uh, Prime Minister Tusk took power. He addressed to Russia only one sentence. He spoke about the world. But about Russia, he said, and as far as Russia is concerned, we are going to develop relations with Russia as it is. In other words, he offered them a promise that we are not going to change the system in Russia. Don't worry. And that was, in my view, decisive. Because Russia is very much afraid of the change of system, regime change, uh, which is, I would say, a kind of the light motive of the former Bush administration. And it, it is continued. It is, uh, I would say, an explanation why Russia is, for example, reacting in Syria in that way and in, in many other places. In other words, they are very much afraid that, in fact, Russia is in the center. <coughs> I, I, it is not my intention to continue. I would like to say that as far as Polish-Hungarian relations, uh, in fact, uh, for the right wing in Poland, Hungary is a kind of the model. And it is officially uh, uh, the leader of the right wing uh, declared that we will have Budapest in Warsaw. I would like to say that this slogan, Budapest in Warsaw, for me it is a kind of the memory of uh, what happened in 56, exactly. We wanted to prevent uh, what happened in Budapest. We wanted to prevent the uh, Soviet tanks in Warsaw. And to say now that uh, it is, I would say, our dream to have Budapest in Warsaw, it is exactly what uh, people in Poland don't like. But nevertheless, I would like to say that the Polish society is divided. And it, it is divided in different, uh, di there are different lines of division. Definitely, uh, uh, nobody would like to introduce another li line of division as far as Hungary is concerned in Poland. And I would like to say that it is, in my view, and this is my last point, what I would like to say, that we have to think both in the United States and in Europe how to define our strategy toward, towards the non-democratic world in general and towards Russia especially. There is no strategy. And in my view, this is, I would say, a very serious problem. There is no leadership, no strategy, and uh, the development is in the process of drifting. 
and such a drift could be very, very uh, dangerous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and I would like to give the floor to the panelists, uh, and then we'll come back to the audience for the second round of questions, comments. Charles? Well, uh, uh, thank you. I, I, I will be brief. I, uh, uh, responding to uh, uh, Steve Zabo's uh, comment uh, that uh, the, there are other types of Russian uh, uh, challenges or threats uh, beyond the military, and of course I fully agree with you. And if I didn't say that, then I, uh, I, I understood that to be the case, whether it is Gazprom or whether it is uh, buying politicians, you know, corruption is very widespread in many countries, um, including the Czech Republic, um, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the Baltic states full of, uh, of, of stories coming out, uh, newspapers and, 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 uh, and elsewhere. So um, I would say that yes, th there remains a Russian challenge, but you don't, um, you don't respond to these new challenges by uh, missile defense. You respond to that by engaging in precisely the kind of thing that Professor Rothfeld mentioned, which is the critical issue is, is, um, is, demo is you know, except the term has, has, has a particular meaning in America, it is democracy promotion, not by military means, as the Bush administration did in the Middle East, but by all other means available to us, including in the European Union. Uh, and I don't believe that this has the kind of priority. Uh, you know, I mean, you were kind enough to mention NATO enlargement. I remain a very strong supporter of what was done in the 1990s, although I see that NATO politically has not been uh, all that effective in so many places. So I think, I think it is on balance, it was uh, the right thing to do, but I also see that uh, the, uh, some of the concerns that, that the critics are uh, uh, correctly uh, are raising. So um, I think NATO could be more uh, usefully used for, yes, for democracy promotion. After all, both <coughs> of these great organizations, NATO and the European Union, are meant to be for democracies. <coughs> I realize it, hasn't, it wasn't always the case, but that's what they are meant to be. Uh, they're meant to be for the democratic commonwealth, and if they are not democracies, then they should leave or be kicked out but there is no mechanism for doing that. Andres? <clears throat> yeah, thanks. Um, I think basically a couple of, couple, of, couple of points because I think you asked also a couple of uh, questions. One is uh, what is our interpretation uh, why the Polish-Russian uh, uh, dialogue takes place and what are the mot motivating factors? I would, I would say in one word, it's pragmatism from both sides, uh, namely the uh, Russia uh, starts to treat Poland, I think, as a player within European Union and NATO. And, uh, uh, well, Britain is in special care, according to the words of Radek Sikorsky, uh, or at least is being advised to be put in a special care, and, 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 and Poland is willing to take this place. So, of course, Poland is, I think that Poland starts to perceive itself as a player and also the other players within European Union and in a wider in a wider transatlantic space start to pursue Poland as a player. And I think this has been one of the reasons for uh, Russian willingness to engage also with Poland. And I think the same is uh, from opposite side and once more the strategic instrumentality is that relations with Russia actually makes Poland to establish its foothold within European Union and NATO as a player, as a mature player, as it was said. I am not immediately, I can say, I'm not immediately uh, so optimistic about a long-term uh, perspectives. Well, probably from Baltic perspective, actually, it is optimistic that there is some pessimism for Polish-Russian relations. Um, because as one of the Polish, uh, Polish diplomats informally said, you know, we have reset or we have reconciliation, we have re-engagement for the last two, three, five years, but we have history of interaction for centuries. And I think this is one historical background and second one is structural geopolitical one. These are two countries which are engaging or which are searching the, you can say, the mm, more influence in a 
in, in, in Europe or again in transatlantic space. And if there is a willingness to find more influence, so at, at some moment I think there might be also element of tension within the region, be it Ukraine, be it the Baltic countries, be it the Visegrad, be it, be it, be it, be it anywhere. Uh, the second point about uh, Russia, Latvia, which was mentioned as a good example. Well, yes and no. On the one hand, I would say yes, it's a good example because Latvia, Baltic countries, uh, we are neighboring Russia, and it means that somehow in terms of the transit, some would say, look, Rotterdam is a German port. The Ventspils or Riga is to some extent a Russian port, and there is some, some structural, uh, you can say, explanation to this, and uh, let's not exaggerate immediately some threats and concerns and risks. But same time, risks remain, and it, it was, I would fully agree with what was asked, in a way the answer already was given. Of course, it is about exporting corruption, exporting routines, exporting the, the business practices and basically the business way of thinking. The, 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 the making, I would not say that there is direct correlation, more investments and more countries fall into the corruption indexes, but I think there's some element of uh, interlinkage uh, is, is, is existing. And uh, as uh, inter um, Transparency International was identifying that there are a couple of countries where money is different than other money, and it is China and Russia with some differences. Of course, again, how it's being done, what is the methodology, it might be discussed, but I think there is some element of truth. And you can see that it's not always politically connected. It's not that, for instance, Latvian, the financial system was shaken by two banking crises. Both of them are connected to Russia. And actually, none of them were connected to the political, to Russian political establishment. Uh, so it was, to some extent, shaken by the business practices, speculative, non-transparent deals which have taken place in last decades. Yeah, so that's why the concerns or risks, they are not directly politically connected with some Kremlin project who is sitting and sort of everything is uh, coordinating. Energy is a very important element in all of this. I fully agree. And the good thing is that from supplies in energy field, the whole discourse, the whole discussion, and I think the center of the importance has moved to the liberalization of the markets. Because in terms of the supplies, it's more and more interconnected. And in case of Latvia or in case of both the countries, we can increasingly speak that we are not any more energy islands, but we are more energy peninsulas, being more and more interconnected with, with, with you can say, European energy mainland. Liberalization, opening markets, making them more transparent is very, very important in this regard. And in this case, I think this will be the next the battleground between also EU and, and, and Russia as well, what are the rules? And you can see already the symptoms of this, be it in Lithuania, be it in Latvia, where are sticks and carrots also the, uh, uh, exploited and used. Uh, the, the answer is, I think, simple in this case. Again, we cannot avoid Russia, and I would also say that Russia is indispensable energy supplies for the Baltics and for the region. Now, let's not say that we immediately can replace with the shale gas. The big hopes also within the Baltic countries, it seems those hopes are, have been a little bit undermined by the recent experiences, by the recent, by the recent, uh, by recent uh, uh, indications uh, what's, what's happening in the field. The, I think important thing is to avoid the monopolistic uh, domination by, I would say, Russian companies within different fields, be it financial, be it energy, be it also transport sector. I think this is an important element. And at the very end, as I say again, and I think this is a good thing about uh, the, the dialogue is that we should not search and blame Russia for all of this. Actually, it's a homework of those countries. It's a homework of the Baltic countries, homework of Latvia, it's a homework of East Central European countries. So at the very end, the answer is found within our own countries. But of course, there is at the same time interaction with those practices which somehow are being transported beyond the borders. Thanks. Michael. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, maybe just one qualification to Professor Gatti. Uh, I'm also representing the uh, Foreign Policy Institute, and I hope I was critical enough, even though there was a representative for our embassy, I don't know if, she's, if the lady's still here, so I hope I was critical enough. Uh, to Slavic question about the uh, investitions in, uh, in Poland, um, Maybe the, the Czech reflection would be that uh, it seems to me that Poland doesn't get any of the Central or Eastern European countries to invest into the strategic uh, uh, parts of Poland. It was definitely the Czech case that there were 
big interest to invest in in, in a couple of your strategic uh, companies and and for political reasons you didn't let us to do that well when we led the Pekka and Orland to buy the uh, Czech Unipetrol, very in, in, an important company. Uh, we now don't know who actually owns the Pekka and Orland exactly, so <laughs> it's the, there, there, is, there is not reciprocity in this case. And then uh, maybe a, a bit of a complex reflection on, on, the, other, on the other issues. Um, uh, when uh, uh, minister, Mr. Minister Rutfeld was um, uh, talking about the diffusion of power, I would go in even further that, there, that, the, 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 that the world will be not only with a diffusion of power, but also with a blurred and then a shared sovereignty. And, and this brings me to the self-confidence of, of European and, uh, and, and, and model, because that's precisely the world that, that Europe can live very easily, because we, we know how to do shared, uh, shared sovereignty. And we know how to how to deal with diffused power. So, so I think that's not a, a worst case scenario for for Europe and for Central Europe. On the contrary, but the problem is that that uh, that there is a lack of confidence in, in Europe uh, recently. And and if if uh, uh, in, if you said that that uh, it was Prime Minister Tusk who said to to the Russian government that there will be a reconciliation because there will be no criticism of what is going on in in Russia. I, I quite frankly I didn't know about that. But I think that's a failure because that's precisely what uh, what, what is um, uh, what is uh, putting the <clears throat> interests bef uh, before values, and, um, um, and 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 that's the lack of confidence. And um, because this is precisely what Russia does. I mean, it's, it's giving selective in incentives. And uh, if we, if uh, if uh, um, uh, Professor Rothfeld was talking about the lack of strategy uh, and lack of coherence, so, and I was talking about lack of coherence within the Czech Republic, within the region, within the EU. And if I ask uh, who 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 is who benefits from that lack of coherence, it's not Central Europe, it's not the Czech Republic, it's not it's Russia. So uh, so I think that that there is a clear uh, uh, a clear case of of, of um, not shying away from uh, defending the values that we stand for. And, and just to conclude, uh, if, um, if Russia was on the, on the pro-democratic path, which is not, and was uh, said a couple of times here, uh, we would not be afraid of, uh, of, uh, of Gazprom. We would not be afraid of, of being dependent on, on, on Russian um, uh, um, uh, energy. We would happily cooperate. We would not be afraid of, um, of um, and, and Russia would not be afraid of, of overthrowing the Syrian government. So things, things that are in our uh, deepest interests would be much easier to be dealt with. But if we will stop talking about, about values, then it will simply never happen. It will simply never happen. Okay, uh, I would like, wait, Charles, please. May I have one, one more minute uh, here? Because first of all, my apology to, to Michael and uh, your to presentation <laughs> and to everybody in this room. Uh, uh, what I would like to say, because there was a part of uh, uh, Steve Zabo's question that I did not respond to, which is that now that uh, and the energy situation is changing and Gazprom's uh, maybe influence is, uh, is in decline, uh, does this mean that Russian influence in, uh, with some politicians and some countries may also decline? Maybe so. Let's hope so. But I would like to, to uh, uh, mention that, that uh, what the Russians do so very well is uh, now, in contrast to the Soviet period, is uh, not to lecture the Central East Europeans, while Americans are wonderful at telling everybody in the world, including the Central Europeans, what to do. And there is a considerable resentment. The Europeans do it too, but not quite to the same extent. So I would say that, you know, American lecturing, pontificating, and uh, knowing everything better than they do has done a lot of harm to our credibility and to the cause of democracy actually there. Uh, relatedly, the kinds of ambassadors that we send uh, to some of these countries, which is a separate topic, and I would love to have an hour to discuss that, but I won't, uh, is, is really, I mean, uh, just look at the uh, Washington Post today of who are we sending as ambassadors to these countries. You know, Hollywood, starlets, and, uh, 
and, and, and others who have no idea where they are going, what the culture is, never been there, don't understand it, and usually actually don't even want to understand it. They just want to have the title after they return as ambassador so and so. And we have been doing this not to every country. Actually, Poland with some ex has been pretty well treated uh, that way. But we have this habit like a banana republic. Uh, sending political appointees there, irritating the leaders because they take it for what it is. They don't count, you see. We send these people there, uh, uh, these lightweights, uh, uh, and uh, who go there and lecture them and so on. So I think we are, uh, we, we could do a lot better and, uh, uh, in these countries, uh, despite of Russia or, or perhaps because the energy situation is uh, modifying. I'm sorry I didn't respond to that question before. Thank you very much. We have already consumed all the time we have uh, for uh, this panel. And I have to, before I express my gratitude to um, distinguished panelists we, uh, who uh, did a great job um, behind this table, I would like to say the following um, thing. I would like to ask James Sher, who was uh, uh, showing his willingness to raise the question to the panelists, uh, to postpone his willingness and uh, ask the same question during the, uh, the third panel. And I would like to address uh, 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 the issue to uh, Janusz Bugajski, who is going to moderate the third panel, to give the, uh, the floor to the James Sher as the first one. Um, now I would like to, uh, to thank all the panelists for um, uh, sharing with us uh, their excellent analytical, uh, well-balanced, uh, uh, very inspiring thoughts. Uh, and uh, um, I think that uh, uh, we learn all uh, um, a lot from, um, from uh, their analyzers. Uh, how this Polish-Russian discourse uh, interfere uh, in the region. Thank you very much, gentlemen. <laughs> now I have one additional announcement. Uh, I would like to please everyone to remain seated um, as uh, we, are go we are going to uh, um, straight to the keynote um, which is going to be delivered by Daniel Russell. Um, and after this lunch, lunch on keynote, we, uh, we will, uh, lunch will, is going to be served. So please remain seated. And uh, the keynote speaker is going to soon take the floor. Oh, uh, the panelists may uh, uh, change it. Thank you very much. No, you were so right. You were so right.
Ladies and gentlemen, if you could just take your seat, our keynote has arrived. We'll start in a moment. Okay, we had our little transition there. Um, colleagues, I could not be more delighted to introduce uh, a friend and a colleague who I've had the great pleasure of working with. Uh, Dan Russell is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State who has the great responsibility for U.S. relations with Russia, Ukraine, Moldova, and Belarus, and he also deals with international security and arms control issues in the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs at the State Department. Um, Dan has a long and distinguished career in the Foreign Service. He has served as the Chief of Staff to the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, uh, Bill Burns, from 2008 to 2009, who's now Deputy Secretary. He then ably served Bill as Deputy Chief of Mission to Moscow uh, from 2005 to 2008, and uh, previously served as Deputy Chief of Mission in Almaty from 2000 to 2003. I asked Dan, and he was so gracious to accept, to offer some thoughts and reflections from the Washington perspective on Polish-Russian relations. He promised me on the elevator down he's going to be a little provocative. We've, we celebrate government officials being provocative. Um, and uh, he's also very graciously agreed after his remarks to take a few questions and answers. And Dan, by way, this group has been engaging all morning in the, the, the positives, the, the challenges of the Polish-Russian relationship, what it's meant to the region. Uh, and so uh, provocative you must be because we've been provocative all morning. So with that, thank you again and welcome. Thanks, Heather. Maybe I'll be lazy and just sit down here. I'll try to um, <clears throat> make a few uh, remarks uh, to start, but uh, I'm mindful of the fact you've had a a pretty long day all, already, and certainly the interaction is the uh, best part uh, of uh, of these events. So let me let me start with a few remarks, and thanks, Heather, for the uh, kind introduction, uh, hitting all the good stuff and none of the bad. Um, <clears throat> uh, and uh, look, I congratulate you and CSIS for organizing this event to address a topic uh, that I think is truly important to the entire transatlantic community, and one that hasn't received as much attention. Uh, as it really deserves. Um, I couldn't resist an invitation to speak uh, because of my longstanding interest in both uh, Poland uh, and Russia. Uh, I was a student uh, in, in Krakow, uh, so I've lived in Poland, and I've been a diplomat in Russia, both in Moscow and Yekaterinburg. So I think I have more than a passing acquaintance uh, uh, with, uh, with both countries. And now in my current job, I find myself uh, working with both Russians and Poles uh, on the global issues uh, that uh, uh, we all face. Um, I've always been fascinated uh, by the interplay between, uh, you know, Poles and, and Russians and Americans. And, uh, you know, looking back at our own Revolutionary War, uh, Tadas Kosciuszko, of course, is the, uh, you know, most famous uh, Polish hero of our uh, own uh, revolution. Um, but and pretty well known. But one thing that's uh, I think less well known is that he befriended uh, John Paul Jones, uh, who was uh, the most famous I, I think naval commander during our own Revolutionary War, who in fact uh, went on to become uh, a, a Navy uh, a Russian admiral. Um, so there are connections here, but that's probably left. Uh, to some uh, great uh, dissertation of the future uh, from some academic who's uh, better qualified uh, than I am. But uh, getting back to the topic here uh, of the day, I, uh, I think um, uh, the United States has a natural interest uh, because Russia and Poland, uh, you know, are, are, are both important uh, to Americans uh, and to American interests. 
Now that might be blindingly obvious, but I think it's it's uh, worth talking a little bit about that. And I, I would say that uh, none of us are naive uh, about uh, about the relationship between uh, Poland and Russia. It's uh, it's a relationship that's been marked by uh, literally centuries of conflict. Uh, it's uh, one in which uh, certainly uh, mutual uh, mistrust and mutual accusations have uh, figured prominently. Um, but at the same time, I can tell you from our own experience uh, that those things add up to missed opportunities. Uh, and that's, that's why it's worth taking a look at where we are. I, I think I would focus on the economic and security aspects uh, of the relationship to sort of illustrate my point about, uh, about the importance. Uh, certainly, uh, Russia and Poland uh, both number today among the top 20 economies uh, in the world. Uh, both economies have shown significant growth, not only in terms of GDP, uh, but in terms of per capita income. Uh, and they've outstripped uh, most of their peers uh, in recent years on, on both of those indicators. Uh, they also have a big trading relationship. Uh, Russia is uh, Poland's largest trading partner outside of the EU, and I think number two actually to Germany in overall trade. But yet, when you look at each country's relationship with the United States uh, in terms of trade, uh, you find that the numbers are a lot smaller than you'd expect uh, for economies of that size. So certainly, that provides a lot of opportunities uh, for future growth and opportunities uh, for Americans uh, and American business and mutually advantageous uh, trade investment. Um, <clears throat> Russia and Poland are obviously uh, playing important roles both in the region and on the global stage. Uh, and in many non-traditional area, uh, areas and challenges that we face in the 21st century. And when I look ahead to this fall, I see that Poland is going to uh, host the COP19 uh, climate change conference. Russia will host uh, the uh, G20 summit. Uh, these are things uh, that certainly no one would have expected 20 or 25 years ago. Um, I, uh, I think um, that Beyond uh, security, uh, we've uh, the security arena is is certainly an area we need to look at uh, as well. And Afghanistan is probably the best uh, best example there, where uh, Poland has been one of the largest contributors in terms of troops uh, to ISAF. Uh, Russia has been uh, the largest contributor in terms of uh, transit rights uh, for getting coalition uh, military personnel and equipment back and forth to Afghanistan and has played a role in uh, training and equipping uh, Afghan forces, uh, most notably in counter-narcotics training, uh, which incidentally started as a, a NATO-Russia uh, project uh, with the support of both Poland and the United States. Um, uh, missile defense, when we look at uh, what's a very controversial uh, issue and one in which the United States uh, thinks is important, uh, you tend to circle back to these same two countries again. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, that's no surprise. Uh, Poland has uh, agreed to be the host of a, the Northern Interceptor Site in the European Phased Adaptive Approach, uh, and the United States still hopes uh, to involve uh, Russia in missile defense uh, cooperation as well. I mean, simply put, uh, we feel that the European Phased Adaptive Approach, uh, together with missile defense uh, cooperation with Russia, uh, would make us all safer uh, from the bullet emerging ballistic missile threat uh, that we see today uh, from the Middle East. Again, a very 21st century uh, way of trying to, uh, uh, trying to look at uh, these issues. But my point is that there, there are benefits uh, that outweigh the baggage uh, in this uh, relationship, and there are benefits that certainly the United States can see. But uh, you know, you're always left with the question, why, you know, 20 years uh, into the uh, post-communist era, are relations uh, no better uh, between these two countries than they are uh, right now? And I think the answer is that the end of communism, despite uh, uh, one author's uh, notes, uh, was not the end of history. Uh, and there's, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of baggage here. Uh, but it's not for lack of trying, if you look back. I, uh, certainly, um, uh, President Yeltsin and, and President uh, Valenza in 1993 uh, issued a you know a joint statement uh, during a landmark trip by uh, Yeltsin to Warsaw that I remember well. Uh, that certainly was a big step uh, towards uh, uh, reconciliation. Uh, in 2000, uh, we saw uh, monuments uh, erected uh, in Russia 
um, to the uh, Polish officers uh, murdered, by, uh, murdered by Stalin. Uh, President Kwasniewski and President Putin each made uh, reciprocal trips uh, to each capital. So there, there's been a lot of work uh, to try to, uh, try to make uh, the relationship better. Um, and, I, and I think uh, in the plain uh, tragedy uh, in Smolensk, which I'm sure you've discussed and I won't uh, uh, review here, uh, I think both there's been a, a, an attempt by both sides at the political level um, to take a very uh, professional, very pragmatic approach uh, and to not try to fuel the very real political passions uh, on, both, uh, on both sides of this. And I think that's, uh, that's a, a commendable way forward. So I think what we have is a picture that emerges of you know slow progress, uh, but over time pretty steady, uh, despite uh, sporadic engagement uh, and, uh, and and disengagement. And uh, and I think this is despite differences over uh, obviously Kaliningrad, Iskenders, uh, Patriots, and uh, SM3s, um, missiles being a big part of uh, some of the issues uh, today. Um, but I think the United States is going to continue uh, to support the process uh, that we've seen between the, the two countries, uh, and it's, it's one that, uh, that we think is, is the right thing to do. And I think I would offer a few suggestions on, on, uh, on the way forward, uh, and what are the, uh, obviously the areas that need work uh, where, uh, where relations could improve. Uh, the first, uh, to paraphrase, uh, uh, President Clinton uh, and his uh, uh, first election uh, campaign, is, it's the economy, stupid. Uh, trade and investment can be a powerful catalyst uh, to overcome uh, differences. Uh, we've, we've seen that in the past with other countries that have had, uh, frankly, a, a relationship as rocky as uh, Poland uh, and uh, in, in Russia. And uh, mutual prosperity has a way of creating stakeholders uh, in both countries. Uh, to enable uh, the relationship to weather the inevitable political uh, ups and downs that, that, you, that you're going to have. Uh, so that's an area that's obviously a fruitful one. And Russia's uh, accession to the World Trade Organization last year uh, creates some more long-term opportunities uh, in, uh, in that vein. Um, the second area, I would argue, going back to my first point, is in, in the area of security. Uh, and in a relationship that's uh, certainly been plagued by mutual mistrust, uh, why transparency is something uh, that, that should be addressed. And I'm uh, talking about transparency in terms of uh, uh, planning, uh, military moves, uh, advanced notification, military exercises on a reciprocal basis. And clearly this goes beyond the bilateral relationship. And here we'd be in many ways talking about uh, a NATO-Russia relationship. And that's something fruitfully uh, that uh, Poland and Russia and the United States could push uh, in the NATO-Russia Council, uh, because this this would uh, would certainly help. And the th the third point I'd make is on uh, on engagement. Uh, there is simply no substitute uh, uh, for uh, engagement, and I don't just mean on the government to government level. Uh, I mean at all uh, all levels. But when I, I, I looked at the tools to do this, I was pretty impressed, actually, um, on how many forums exist out there uh, to actually uh, pursue engagement. Uh, you have the Strategic Commission for uh, Polish-Russian Cooperation that um, the foreign ministers chair. You've got the Kaliningrad Triangle Talks, uh, Parliamentary Dialogue, uh, what we would call a Track 1.5 uh, Dialogue uh, on uh, in, um, in the Polish-Russia uh, group for difficult issues. There are regular uh, interparliamentary exchanges. Uh, there are youth exchanges through each country's uh, uh, center for dialogue and uh, understanding. So you've got a lot of mechanisms in place uh, to do more uh, on this front. Uh, and we found that structures like this uh, work pretty well. Uh, in fact, if you just look at the United States relationship with each of these countries, you'll see uh, something similar. I mean, we have a strategic dialogue uh, with Poland. Uh, we have a, an interesting democracy dialogue uh, with Poland, which is quite different than what we do with other countries. Uh, we, uh, with Russia, uh, we have a bilateral presidential commission uh, with over 20 working groups. So I think that it, that structured engagement uh, is is certainly one of the ways uh, to deal uh, with a lot of this. And and you can see some small. 
uh, successes uh, in the relationship. And I'd look at uh, last year's uh, uh, yeah, small border traffic agreement or local border traffic agreement uh, as, as one of them, uh, helping to increase or make easier travel uh, between Kaliningrad and uh, Poland's northern provinces and hopefully uh, spurring some, uh, some economic activities there. So I'm not trying to minimize the very real issues uh, that exist between the two countries, uh, but I, I think it's easy to catalog what's wrong with the relationship. Uh, but as a diplomat, we don't get, uh, I certainly don't get paid to simply identify problems. Uh, we're trying to look for creative ways forward. Uh, and certainly on a pragmatic basis, there's a case to be made uh, for better relations uh, between the two countries, and I see that as uh, a very beneficial state of affairs uh, for the United States and our own interests. Now, in terms of our own role, I'm uh, reminded uh, uh, after the, uh, uh, the Smolensk uh, air, air crash tragedy, um, I was at a meeting with the um, uh, Polish foreign minister and, uh, and Mrs. Clinton, and she uh, uh, complimented uh, Minister Sikorsky on the, the approach that uh, Poland had, uh, had taken to this and, you know, offered some support in, in trying to help with better relations. And, and I remember him looking at her saying, we've been working on this for uh, a long time uh, directly with um, uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov and others, so, uh, which, is a, which is a good sign uh, that uh, we can see a way ahead because the one thing I can be optimistic about uh, is certainly uh, the capabilities of the uh, uh, Poles and Russians um, who are uh, clearly going to be uh, among the most successful peoples uh, in this century. So uh, why don't I just stop there and take questions. Dan, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate your reflections. I, I'm going to be very mindful of the time. We have about 10 minutes, and I want to collect a few questions. Uh, uh, and you know, I know it's always tough when you come into the middle of a conversation. You don't quite get the benefit of our conversation earlier this morning. Uh, but I, I want to pull you closer, if I may take the moderator's prerogative, to talk a little bit about what's going on internally to Russia uh, dynamics. Uh, Minister Altfeld gave a phenomenal keynote, sort of talking about the importance of his working group on difficult matters was the role of civil society, of education, of media, yet we see the constrictors of this uh, role. And so as you're looking down the road, the two summits that will be coming up uh, this month and then in September, as you're rethinking uh, U.S. policy, um, how big of a role does uh, civil society, what's going on internally to Russia, domestic opposition, how, how, how does that play into your thinking? And if you could offer reflections on how that affects the, uh, the dialogue to, to, towards the region. We're watching developments very closely and there's obviously a great expression of concern. Yeah, and I, uh, I, I, like, having lived in Russia for uh, seven years, uh, and uh, civil society uh, is alive and well in, in Russia, <clears throat> and uh, the, the, the mistaken idea that somehow uh, that this is all some, uh, that civil society is some sort of uh, politically motivated fifth column uh, exercise uh, that's uh, completely funded and directed from abroad is just contrary to the, the reality in Russia. Uh, and I'm, I've been amazed at how many uh, bloggers there are in Russia uh, and the diversity of opinion uh, that's, uh, that's out there. So I don't, I, I don't think that that's, uh, that's, that's become a, part, a fab part of the Russian uh, societal fabric and I don't think it's gonna go away uh, no matter uh, what the government does. Um, we're uh, very concerned uh, by uh, the uh, unprecedented, I would say, moves uh, that we see against uh, certainly a, a select group uh, of uh, actors on, uh, on the civil society uh, side. And I, uh, like I said, I just think this is misplaced. Uh, and the, the idea somehow uh, that a small group of people from uh, outside uh, would be able to direct the fate of uh, Russia is just, it, it's, it's a crazy notion. Um, Russians are going to be in charge of their own future, uh, and they're going to have people both in and out of government who are going to do it. Uh, but certainly it's been a part of our dialogue, uh, and, and we're, we're, we're concerned about this. 
I'll take uh, Cornelius and Janusz, and then Suzanne back there, and then we'll have you wrap up. Thank you very much. Cornelius Ochmann, Bertelsmann Foundation, Germany. Uh, Mr. Russell, you mentioned the role of trade and economic relations. So uh, the German-Russian or German-Polish economic development is excellent. The trade is higher than 80 billion uh, euro with uh, Russia and about 80 billion euro with, uh, with Poland. Uh, it, at the same time, the trade of US with uh, uh, Eastern Europe, I mean with Russia, with Poland, Ukraine and other countries is uh, falling down. Could you uh, uh, tell us more about the strategy or is there a strategy, uh, or economic strategy for Eastern Europe, uh, especially uh, towards Russia in Washington? Well, do you want to take one or do you want to take a couple or do you want to answer one by one? However you want to do it. It may be easy if we take a couple. Sure. And I'm going to give you a piece of paper and I'm going to give you a pen. <laughs> you <got it. coughs> oh, right behind you. Hi, Ben. Um, Janusz Bukajski. I have a, a question uh, about U.S. policy. We often hear from analysts uh, in Europe's East, as well as some government officials, that there is no coherent U.S. policy towards the region. Uh, for instance, even the relationship with Russia is driven by out-of-area interests, whether it's Syria, Iran, North Korea, and so on and so forth. For example, they cite little commitment to further NATO enlargement, uh, waning interest in, in transatlantic relations, uh, little interest in democratization in Russia itself, uh, and seemingly little focus on the potential unrest in Russia that could culminate not only in potential disintegration, but would have a spillover effect in the region that we thought was already consolidated in terms of its membership of, of Western institutions. How would you respond to that? That's <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is a tough crowd. Did I say that? Uh, Suzanne, why don't we let you go, and then you can sum up, Dan. Right Suzanne Lotarski, former Commerce Department official for this region. Uh, you mentioned several, twice uh, the Smolensk air crash. Uh, unfortunately, it had not been discussed earlier. Uh, and uh, you know, it seems to me that perhaps here is an ins instance of failure of dialogue, because I think if you take a look at it, both sides handling of it, both the Polish and the Russian side, uh, unfortunately left too many issues and questions uh, for to be seized on. Uh, as to what really went on and how it was happened, and that somehow greater dialogue and cooperation in that period, difficult as it is under such circumstances, might have yielded a, a better longer-term outcome for the Polish-Russian relationship uh, and possibly for uh, both sides internally. Uh, this is a tough crowd. You got some tough ones. Go right ahead. Well, on. Um, Coming back to the, the trade and investment question, uh, I, I think in terms, if, if you're looking at potential growth, um, uh, uh, Anders Oslin, who you probably know uh, from the Peterson Institute, uh, did an excellent study uh, on the uh, potential for uh, growth in two-way trade and investment in connection with uh, last year's uh, uh, debate on WTO and, and PNTR. And, and I think he's uh, still done probably the best work on that. Uh, but what I took away from that study, I'm not an economist, uh, is uh, that, that certainly there is a lot of headroom uh, here uh, for, uh, for growth. And if I, uh, if I look at uh, examples that work, uh, I'd probably cite Boeing's um, uh, <coughs> relationship uh, with Russia, where you have uh, you know, a, a truly uh, proverbial win-win uh, situation, uh, where um, Boeing has a, <coughs> a, a large uh, design bureau in Moscow. Uh, it sources a lot of its uh, titanium uh, from uh, the Urals. Uh, it uses all of this material and brain power to build planes, and Russia is one of the biggest markets uh, for those planes. So that's, that's certainly an, an example, of, if you like, a pilot project in some ways of, uh, of what's possible. I don't, look, this, the U.S.-Russia relationship is never going to have an economic relationship that looks like uh, Russia and Germany. Um, but it can still, uh, there's no way to go but up. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, if you look at the energy relationships 
the deal between uh, Exxon Mobil and Rosneft, uh, with Exxon being <coughs> interested in, in developing uh, the Arctic, with Rosneft being interested in investing in Texas. Uh, this is such a different scenario than what we saw during the Cold War. Uh, that it gives me hope uh, for optimism, but ultimately it'll be up to the private sector, or the two, uh, the private sector and uh, some of the actors in, in Russia to see how far they take this relationship. But the, I, I think the potential is there. Um, on the bigger question of uh, of U.S. policy, I, uh, I, I remember I'm like you all. I'm a Europeanist, and I, I look at uh, my my world through those eyes, uh, and I. Our approach has been uh, that the going back to uh, the uh, President Bush the Elder, the idea of a Europe whole, free, and at peace, uh, in my mind, is unfinished business. Uh, and that Europe whole, free, and at peace obviously always included Russia. Uh, and uh, that's uh, something we we want to see. And uh, we've certainly uh, since I. Uh, get the joy of dealing with uh, part of the former Soviet Union, uh, certainly the backsliding on democracy uh, in Ukraine uh, has been uh, very troubling uh, as well. Uh, we've got issues in, in Belarus. Um, Moldova finally has a government and is the uh, poster child of at least uh, one of the countries moving in the right direction. Uh, but I think that we can't ignore uh, the unfinished business there. We need to continue to focus on this. Uh, and yes, we have new challenges, as many of our European friends uh, would argue, that are going to require a lot of resources uh, in the Middle East and in North Africa. But we need to do this all, uh, all at once. Uh, and granted, none of this has gone as quickly uh, as we would have liked, and progress is not linear. Uh, but I think we share the same vision of uh, Poland uh, and certainly some of the other uh, countries in the region on where we want to see this go. So I, uh, I, I think we're going to have to continue to do this. Um, <clears throat> and I know there, uh, I remember quite well as a lot of Central Europeans being very disappointed, uh, certainly during the first uh, Obama administration uh, with the policy, uh, which some of us, me included, found a little puzzling because the, the relationship was naturally going to change. Uh, these countries had joined the European Union and NATO and become uh, become full partners uh, with uh, with the United States and members of the transatlantic community. And naturally, that relationship was going to change. I, I wouldn't want to go back to the focus uh, that we had and the challenges that we had in the 90s. I, I regard that as a success story. Uh, but you're right to flag this, and you're right that it deserves more attention. On uh, 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 Smolensk, um, <clears throat> this uh, this is going to be, uh, I think, an issue that's out there for a while, uh, and you're uh, you're certainly right uh, that things could have gone better. But um, maybe I've worked too long in this part of the uh, the world, but they could have gone a hell of a lot worse. Um, I, and I th and I think it is encouraging that both sides did uh, did make an effort and continue to make an effort. It's it's uh, it's. It's not something that's uh, completely done yet, um, uh, but it, it's going to be one of those issues uh, that certainly is going to re require more attention if you're going to get past some of the historic issues uh, between the two countries. Please join me in thanking Dan for stopping by, sharing some thoughts, and we're going to watch very closely in two and a half weeks when Mr. Obama and Mr. Putin meet in Northern Ireland. So thank you so much, Dan. Thank you.